Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Just going to give it a minute for some people to file in. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, we're so excited to have everyone here. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to the 20th edition in our webinar series on the convergence of wetland science and technology. Uh, my name is Cameron Davis uh, and I'm the business development rep and marketing manager at Ecobot. Uh, today's topic is habitat conversation planning, uh, best management practices. Uh, we've got a great panel of experts with us today and we will introduce them in just a few minutes. Uh, once we kick things off, we're eager to have a two-way discussion uh, during the presentation. Um, so you can feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, we also have uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window, a Q&A button, and you can use that to ask any questions that you'd like to have answered by our panel, and we'll field them directly towards the end of our discussion and our webinar. Uh, so our host today is my colleague with nearly two decades experience as a wetland scientist and also the co-founder and chief scientist at Ecobot, Jeremy Shavey. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to him. Thank you, Cameron, and welcome back for all of those of you who have been with us before for these webinars and the convergence of wetland science and technology. Um, very excited for our exploration today with HCPs. Um, we've got a fantastic panel and group of presenters who have come together for your viewing pleasure, as well as perhaps hopefully everyone will take something home and, uh, and learn something today that will be beneficial for your professional journey in life. So um, wanted to start off, I know there's still a few people coming in, but I wanted to start off that if you know what this species is on the picture here, put it into the chat and uh, We'll let you know if anybody gets it right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move slides here in a moment. But so if you know what this species is, this is a federally listed species. Um, it's kind of a fun one that I've spent an ample amount of time with. So if you know what it is, shoot it out in the chat. And otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get started. So as uh, Cameron mentioned, I've spent the last 20 years working in the wetlands and sensitive habitats space. And uh, I do a lot of work with threatened and endangered species. And in five days, I'm gonna be headed down to the highlands of Guatemala, the Sierra de Cuchamantanes, um, working in a 40,000 acre uh, private preserve that we've been putting together over the last 10 years that is protecting high elevation karst and cloud forest. And so I just wanted to kind of bring that to everybody's attention. This is an amazing project. The uh, executive director of our organization, Philip Tanimoto, found this site via remote sensing um, using various color cards and heat index to find a completely enclosed canopy with old growth forest. And so we've been working down there uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, and you can see from this aerial photograph, you can see that older forest in the darker green versus the patched mosaic of some of the highland farming that the Quiche people are involved with. And so this particular forest, of course, with the karst is riddled with caves. We've found multiple new species in the area, multiple uh, red listed species and uh, it's just been a phenomenal experience and so we're going to be up in canopies climbing 160 year old uh, ancient oak trees and looking at pteridophytes up in the top so I just wanted to start it off because this is why we most of us are doing this we do this because we love our planet we love uh, we love, we get uh, connected to specific species, and I feel that that is probably the most important thing that we can remember from a high level today is that when 
we create a bond with a specific species, we become a voice in policy, a voice in regulation, a voice in intelligent planning so that we can promulgate the existence of that species into the foreseeable and unforeseeable future. So with that, I'm gonna segue into our great presentations that we have today. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce our, our panelists and presenters here shortly. And then we're going to hear from uh, Trish Adams around uh, HC, HCPs. Uh, Colleen is going to talk to us about procedures for successful HCPs from the consulting side of things. Uh, and then Dr. Dale Sparks is going to be speaking about prediction modeling for element occurrences to help streamline HCPs. So very strong theme here today. Um, give you all a quick Ecobot update in terms of data, data utilization and a quick plug for our next webinar coming up in March. And then we should have enough time at the end for at least 10 or 15 minutes of questions and answers. And so again, this will be is a nice segue. If you have come into the room in the last couple of moments, if you have questions that are specific or are technical related or specific to address to one of the presenters or the panelists, please put that in the Q&A uh, bubble. If you hover your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you can click on that Q&A and en enter your question there. And then I will curate those while the presenters are making their presentations and we will address those at the end. If you have general comments, please put those in the chat or if you want to address just one of the presenters or panelists directly, enter those into the chat as well. Final thing in the chat, if you know what that species was from the opening slide, please put that into the chat as well. Okay, so uh, just to start us off here today, we have a, uh, again, a fantastic panel. Um, Trish Adams is the National uh, Habitat Conservation Planning Coordinator with US Fish and Wildlife is joining us today as one of the key presenters. Um, she has been working with HCP since 19, 99. She now works with HQ, of course, and is uh, living outside of Philly. Um, and Trish, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but the key that you feel like you want people to walk away with is that what you're working with is not only creating guidance and support to, uh, to, the, to various regions, but also the most important thing for you is the consistent implementation of HCPs across the entire country. So um, that's what Trish is, is really bringing today. Victoria uh, Foster or Tori, she is the uh, coordinator for IPAC. Um, and so she is uh, not going to be presenting anything today though she is going to make a little plug for IPAC uh, at the beginning of our Q&A session. So Tori, thank you for coming back and joining us again. Colleen, this is Colleen's first time joining us here on an Ecobot webinar. Colleen is, works with ECT, is based in Tampa. Um, we found out in our, in our tech check earlier that Trish and Colleen not only used to, to do some surfing together, but they also worked on one of the oil spill cleanups together down in Florida as well. So Colleen is here to talk to us today from the consulting side into, in respect to threatened and endangered species, complexities, HCPs, et cetera. Um, and then Dale, uh, Dr. Dale Sparks with ESI in Cincinnati um, has been working with HCPs since 2002. Um, and as he says, he is a refugee from academia to consulting. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that, Dale. Um, and he leads the modeling group with ESI. He's got some great things to share with us today. So um, this, is our, this is our team for the day. And of course, I'm the chief scientist and co-founder of Ecobot. And so excited to be sharing our 20th webinar with you all. So Trish, I would love to invite you to go ahead and take yourself um, off of mute and bring your camera up if you don't mind. And then I will advance to your first slide and let me know when you're ready to, to continue advancing. Okay, just so you know, Jeremy, I can't see your screen. So like, I could not see the picture of the, the bird. So I may not be able to 
see my screen. I'm able to see his screen. So just if that helps. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me. Aha, no. now I can. I just had to close something. All right, okay. we're good. Okay. Trick play, Trish. Trick play. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. As Jeremy mentioned, I'm with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm in our headquarters office and I coordinate the National Habitat Conservation Planning um, team um, nationally. Um, so today I'd like to give you a brief high level overview about HCPs, the benefits of developing them, some of their challenges, tips for success and what we're current, currently working on to improve the process. So, but first I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the ESA and, and kind of explain where section 10 fits in. So um, next slide, please. All right, so the ESA was passed in 1973. It forms the basis of endangered species protection in the United States. And its purpose is to prevent endangerment and extinction of species due to human impacts on ecosystems. It protects um, species um, as well as their habitat, and it gives joint authority to both Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the National Marine Fisheries Service. Next slide, please. So here are the sections of the Endangered Species Act, and the ones that are highlighted are the ones that primarily touch um, HCPs. Um, but when the ESA was first uh, authorized, um, only federal agencies were able to be exempted from potential Section 9 violation. And Section 9 highlights the prohibited acts. So that's take, you know, the harm, harm, harass, pursue, hoot, hunt, shoot, wound, blah, 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 all of that, that you're not allowed to do. Um, and uh, uh, Non-federal entities were not um, given a mechanism under the act in order to receive the same kind of protections from potential Section 9 violation until Section 10 was added in 1988. And that gave birth to um, the incidental take permitting processes that are described in sections 10A1A and 10A1B. There are two, two ways to do that. I'm going to focus on section 10A1B. And um, seeking an incidental take permit is voluntary, but once an applicant has decided that they wish to um, seek an incidental take permit, then they are subject to the current regulations and the service will evaluate their HCP in accordance to the current policy and guidance at, at that time. And under section six, um, that's where there's we incentivize applicants to come in and participate in this voluntary process. So there's actually federal funding available um, through working with your state agency to receive funds to help develop the HCP itself. And once you receive a permit, then there's um, a land acquisition grant that's available only to permittees that help to augment the HCP itself. It can't, that can't be used for mitigation, but to help augment the success of the HCP. And so I have a trivia question for you. Does anyone know what section one of the ESA is? Go ahead and throw it in the chat and we can talk about that later. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, take is defined under section nine as harm, harass, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, um, collect or attempt to engage in any such activity um, of a threatened and endangered species. And then harm was later um, defined as a significant habitat modification where it kills um, or injures a listed species through impairment of their essential behaviors. And their essential behaviors are um, breeding, feeding and sheltering. And so typically HCP, the type, the type of take that we authorize through an incidental take permit is usually related to harm. Next slide, please. So what are, what are incidental take permits and habitat conservation plans? 
Sometimes you hear people say, oh, I'm going to seek an, um, a, a permit for a habitat conservation plan, and that's not really accurate. The incidental take permit is the actual legal instrument through which we authorize take to that authorized individual. And the habitat conservation is a requirement of that permit application. So through the HCP, that is how the applicant demonstrate to us how they will meet issuance criteria. And it's a requirement of the incidental take permit. And so once that permit is issued, uh, implementation um, in its full um, is a, it becomes a legal, a, a legal binding agreement between the Secretary of the Interior and the permit holder. So it's it that habitat conservation plan is very important. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, the HCP must demonstrate how the applicant will meet the issuance criteria. And if you aren't familiar, um, so the issuance criteria are that the taking um, is incidental to, but not the purpose of an otherwise lawful activity. The applicant will, to the maximum extent practicable, minimize and mitigate the impacts of the taking and they will ensure that adequate funding to fully implement the HCP will be provided. And the taking will not appreciably reduce the likelihood of survival and recovery of the species in the wild. And so that one's pretty important. Next slide, please. So why develop these HCPs? What can they do? So for one thing, it can reduce the conflict between endangered species conservation and the ability of people to move forward with important economic activities such as development. So it reduces that conflict. It can streamline the permitting processes, particularly if you have an HCP that's a programmatic that um, integrates other federal or state permitting, you can have a one-stop shop for all your permitting activities within, um, within one plan. And that can greatly shave years off of um, the development of, um, to getting from development to, uh, and permitting to actually on the ground construction. And it provides this lawful mechanism for non-federal entities to, um, to be protected under the ESA, like I mentioned before. And, um, and these plans also describe all the anticipated impacts and how those impacts can be minimized and mitigated. And, and this is a big one for applicants is that it greatly reduces the risk of violating the ESA and, um, and quite frankly, third party lawsuits um, that this is conducting um, and developing an HCP and getting your incidental take permit really helps to shield you from um, a lot of that. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned a lot of the benefits for an applicant, but kind of what what the, the, the win, it's really a win-win. I mean, and it does provide regulatory assurance that the activities um, are covered from incidental take. Like I mentioned, it shields the permittee from potential ESA violations, reduce the threat of lawsuits, and it provides consistency for the regulated activities. So it provides that regulatory assurance. So applicants will know right up front what they're expected to do as far as the minimization and mitigation requirements. And it, and as I mentioned, it can really shave off a lot of time in the permitting process. And for us, it, um, it also is a conservation tool that supports recovery implementation because many of the activities that are being proposed in HCPs are some of the key threats to those species as, out, as identified in um, our recovery plans and HCPs can do their part to help minimize some of those threats and usually over a fairly long, significant amount of time. Next slide. 
And so um, they, if I didn't hammer this home enough, you know, they provide this regulatory certainty and, um, and they are protected by the no surprises assurances. So once we enter into this agreement, no surprises are, um, are mutual. Uh, so once that plan is agreed to, we, we can't change it. Um, even if we made a mistake, um, we're sort of bound. But that said, there's um, the five point policy allows and, and requires that especially long-term HCPs incorporate adaptive management to address some potential change circumstances that might happen over the life of a HCP. And for applicants such as counties, states, or corporations that might have um, fairly um, long-term comprehensive plans, they can address a lot of those potential conflicts with listed species early on, and they can um, really design where, where their um, development activities are gonna occur and where conservation is going to occur where it makes most sense. And it gives us that opportunity and to ensure that we get connectivity through a, a reserve design. And it provides that um, anyone who's participating in an HCP with, that, with a game plan, it's a concrete plan that they can follow and they have that security. And for us, it really helps us to look big picture and reduce um, maybe some uncoordinated decision making um, along the way that may result in incremental habitat loss and in inefficient project review on our part. And, and it provides consistency across, across the board, especially when we have shared um, resources across multiple regions or field offices, we can ensure that we have consistent minimization and mitigation requirements um, for applicants to follow. Next slide, please. And so that all sounds really great. So what's the catch, right? So the, the HCP program is oftentimes um, criticized uh, for the process can take um, a long time because they can be difficult to negotiate. Oftentimes that is um, dependent upon the complexity of the HCP as well as the number of species. And the HCP program is designed to be pretty nimble and to allow applicants to develop a plan that works for them. But if they're too creative, then that can cause a level of uncertainty and that might take a little more time in order to um, get that plan forward. And it can be expensive, um, but when they're done, most feel it was worth it because of the cost savings that is um, gained by that streamlined process and the, the regulatory certainty that they provide. And we hear sometimes from NGOs, particularly some of the older HCPs, that they aren't um, as effective at meeting some of the biological goals and objectives of the plan and maybe aren't the best conservation tools. But we're working on that. Next slide. So um, there's a lot of things that both the service and applicants can do in order to ameliorate some of those criticisms, particularly as um, for it, it takes a long time to negotiate or it's, it's hard to negotiate and may take a long time. So one of the things to do um, for sure is before engaging is do your homework. This is my best advice. Read the regulations, the law, um, the guidance and policies that are out there for HCPs. And one of the key bits of um, guidance I could offer is to read the 2016 HCP um, handbook. And that provides um, a really great tool to give you guidance all along the way and really explains what the process is. And I like to describe it as a, a uh, as a pantry, it has all the ingredients that you need in order to develop any level or any type of HCP. The other advice is to not jump into developing your HCP right away and start with the biology. Take a step back and really focus on your project management. 
uh, set good timelines and, and work with the service to come up with what's reasonable. Identify those key decision points where um, the different milestones as you're moving forward in planning um, have to be approved up the chain of command, both within the service and on the applicant side. Maybe you have to um, consult and get input from CEOs or, or other approvals. Make sure you identify those early on and certainly bring in your solicitors and lawyers early into the process so they can become familiar and get buy-in on the approach. And they could identify any potential pitfalls because you don't want to find those at the 11th hour. And like any other kind of relationship in life, it really boils down to the people. So it's really important early on, and especially when there might be an air of, of mistrust between an applicant and the service, and take the time in order to build that trust. And whatever you do, work really hard not to corrode that trust as you go along. And so that happens with good communication and engaging all along. Worst thing you want to do is to, uh, as, a, um, as a property owner or a business person, to relinquish complete control to the consultant to negotiate the HCP. Um, I've seen it where um, we get to the very end and the decision makers up the chain had no idea what um, some of the consultants um, agreed to in that plan and it wasn't acceptable to them. So we basically had to start over. So um, that's really important to keep everybody um, in tune and find your HCP champions. Those are the people that have the momentum, particularly in some of these really large landscape scale HCPs. Those um, champions can be um, stakeholders, they could be biologists, they could be consultants, it, it all depends. And sometimes it's, it's the actual people that might be working in the county itself. And so maximize your short window of opportunity that you have, especially for counties. Um, you want to um, watch your election cycles because sometimes turnover in elections um, uh, may have an impact on your plan moving forward because sometimes the new officials don't want to implement or agree to something that the previous or their predecessor had agreed to. And don't forget your stakeholders. And um, if you're not familiar with the National HCP Coalition, um, uh, I can provide a link in the chat later. They are a great resource and um, they actually have a mentoring program. So if you have an applicant that might be a little hesitant and really doesn't trust maybe the service that they're giving them the right answers on how to move forward, um, you can reach out to the coalition. They have a mentoring program that can help with that. Next slide. And what's on the horizon? Well, we've got a lot of irons in the fire right now. Um, one thing with Section 6 planning assistance grants, where we have expanded that, that um, now that projects under Section 10A1A, so that's candidate conservation agreements with assurances or safe harbor agreements, um, applicants who want or landowners that want to participate in those can apply for planning grants to help them with that. We are also proposing revisions to the Section 10 implementing regulations. That's going to be a fairly big deal. They've not been um, revised in 20 some years. And the goal there is to we're going to increase some flexibility in the HCP program. We're going to simplify the CCAA and safe harbor process, and we're going to clarify um, what's required in HCPs and what's needed for us to determine that the application is complete. Also, Ecosphere, this is, this is um, a really fantastic tool for the first time. Um, we will have a, a, a process in which to track 
um, all of the work that goes into negotiating an HCP with applicants. And this will live in the cloud from cradle to grave. So this should really help to ameliorate some of the problems with staff turnover or losing files and those types of things that sometimes happen when you're dealing with an HCP that's been on the books for maybe 20, 30, 40 years. And, um, and e-permitting, we have a new uh, online tool that you can now apply for incidental take permits, well, actually any fish and wildlife permit online. And if we uh, finalize the implementing regulations, we will be updating the, the HCP handbook and the HCP training course at our National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia. And uh, that course is open to anyone. So if you're interested in participating in that, you can. Um, we're going to do our first in-person um, training uh, in February, uh, March of next year. And I think that's it. Great, thank you. It's really perfect to get that high level. So what I'd love to do now is in reintroduce Colleen Riley with ECT and talk about the actual successful implementation of HCPs from the consulting side of things. So Colleen, I'll turn it over to you. Just let me know when you went to advanced slides. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Jeremy said, um, I'm representing the consulting side of things. And today I wanted to focus in on low effect HCPs. Um, the HCP program is a conservation planning program for imperiled species. It was really not designed to be a permitting program. Now here in region four and Florida specifically, project proponents sometimes you know, really do need to use section 10 as more of a permitting program, meaning we often need to approach the process with the ultimate goal of obtaining an individual ITP. And sometimes there's no other avenue for obtaining it. Um, you know, there's no programmatic option, there's no umbrella HCP or no federal nexus to go through section seven. Um, as Trish just alluded, the general perception and some of the criticisms is that the, um, sorry, the, uh, sorry, a message just popped up and I got off track, <laughs> off track here. But some of the criticisms is that the HCP process is daunting. You know, it takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. Um, that may be the case for some of the more complex landscape level or regional HCPs, but we really need to shift that perception to encourage the process in order to get those benefits she also mentioned, um, you know, primarily conservation for our imperiled species, but also that project proponents have the regulatory certainty and obtain the legal protection necessary to move forward with their activities. So the low effect HCP is one way the section 10 process can be streamlined and may therefore be considered more desirable by a project proponent. And that's when minor impacts are involved. So um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, today we want to discuss an overview of the low effect HCP, uh, what it is and how your plan qualifies, uh, review the guidance available to determine if your plan qualifies, look at the timeline for processing, touch on the section 10A1B permit processes, and review a case study for the Florida Sand Skink um, <clears throat> here in Florida to highlight the conflict, um, the procedures followed, and the outcomes for a low effect HCP. And then end by reviewing some BMPs that really can be applied to all HCPs with the goal of expediting the process. And I think you know that's what most parties want. Uh, next slide. So the low effect HCP is exactly what it sounds like. Um, this is a special category of HCPs for those involving minor or negligible effects on federally listed proposed or candidate species and their habitats and minor or negligible effects on other environmental values or resources. Uh, you'll see this is important when we talk about the NEPA process. The goal is to expedite processing of HCPs with inherently low impacts and, you know, a low effect HCP is still an HCP. 
So you must meet the issuance criteria for the HCP under section 10A to B. Um, so keep that in mind. And Trish provided a good summary of what those criteria are. Uh, so next slide. HCPs are evaluated on a case by case basis. Um, it's important to remember that, you know, something like the size of your permit area might not dictate your level of impact. So you could have a very small permit area that has a significant impact to imperiled species. And you know, conversely, you can have a very large project that might have minor impacts. So the determination is based on the anticipated impacts prior to the implementation of the mitigation plan, but it does consider avoidance as part of the action. Uh, the biggest time savings with low effect HCPs is that they don't have to go through a complex NEPA process. Um, again, because the impacts are minor or negligible, these HCPs are categorically excluded pursu pursuant to the department manual. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so how do you know if your plan uh, will qualify for a low effect HCP? There is a screening tool available. This is pretty helpful. And it can see, you can see if you fit the criteria for both low effect and categorical exclusion. So I provided a link there just so you can be aware of the screening tool and um, check it out if you're thinking you might wanna look at that. It's, it's pretty easy to follow and just has a few questions. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> the biggest question we get on HCPs and the section 10 process you know, is how long will this take? And the timeline is dependent really on a number of factors. For less complex, um, simple HCPs that have minor impacts and a categorical exclusion from NEPA, um, the process from start to finish can be about 14 months. Um, I don't expect everyone to be able to read that entire timeline template from US Fish and Wildlife that I put on the side here, but the takeaways are that the steps in the process are on the left, and there's quite a few. Um, the timeline is provided in months along the top, and then the color coding is for responsibility. So green is the US Fish and Wildlife Service, peach is the applicant, yellow is the public comment period. And finally, if you go all the way down to the bottom right, that's where you get a permit decision. And if you follow that up to the top, you know, you'll see you're at month 14. Now, again, this is a timeline template for low effect HCP. It's not a promise on timeline. Um, one of the other takeaways you can see from this table is that multiple processes are happening concurrently. Um, and I think it's easy to tell how early planning, the quality of information you're providing, the availability of staff resources, and open communication is so important throughout the process because at any point you can go backwards or any of these steps can take longer and that would draw the process out. Um, next slide. So the process for permitting low effect HCPs is just like any other HCP and there are three main phases. Uh, phase one is the planning or pre-application phase and this is the most critical phase. Um, this is where it's important to note that this is an applicant driven process. You know, the applicant is really determining the extent and type of take they might anticipate as a result of their action. And ultimately the applicant is determining if an ITP is pursued. Um, this is the phase where the applicants are coordinating with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and confirming the requirements of the plan. This is where the applicant develops the draft HCP, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is working concurrently on NEPA compliance, compliance with National Historic Preservation Act, and the internal Section 7 process. Uh, next slide. Uh, phase two is really the permit processing phase where U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the lead uh, responsible party. That's a little bit different from phase one where the applicant is really kind of in charge of the process. Um, public review period for categorical exclusions is 30 days. Um, that's a timeline savings from um, an environmental assessment level, which is 60 days or an environmental impact statement type of compliance document, which is 90 days. Uh, this is the phase where you're resolving any outstanding issues and hopefully you're getting to a permit decision and issuance. Uh, phase three is where you implement your conservation strategy from your HCP. You're initiating the covered activities, um, including implementation of avoidance and minimization measures, and you're providing your monitoring and reporting. Uh, next slide. 
So in thinking about those processes and the main phases associated with them, I wanted to look at a case study of a low effect conservation plan for the sand skink. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, just a quick overview, the sand skink is a threatened species of lizard that's endemic to the sandy ridges in central Florida. It occurs primarily in native and degraded upland habitats that can include areas like agricultural areas and roadsides. And, and this really highlights the conflict for us with this species is because the degraded um, habitats such as agricultural areas are oftentimes, and even more so now, being prioritized for development. And that could be for a number of reasons. You know, the cost of land is lower, there's less clearing involved, um, and there's probably a low presence by wetlands or other sensitive features. Um, so for skinks, you know, these habitats may still harbor a low density or remnant population, even though there might not be many other species issues because of the past habitat management. But also because we're in an upland habitat, we often don't have a wetland issue that kind of pushes us through the Section 7 process. And so that's why this is a species where we often encounter the need for a Section 10 permit program, and um, we typically can qualify for a low effect HCP. So for, um, so for our project, uh, and some of, the, some of the challenges associated with it was we had a conversion of fallow and active citrus within the species range. Um, it was located in the consultation area for the species and suitable soils and elevations were there so it could support potential occurrence. Uh, the survey protocol for the species is pretty intensive and it's restricted to a certain time of year. Uh, like I said, there was no federal nexus to get through the section seven process and the developer on this project and their initial consultant and design firm was not familiar with the ecosystems of Florida and essentially species occurrence was overlooked. Um, and this created a major time crunch where we were really unsure if the deadline could be met for a large industrial development project considering the section 10 requirements. So next page. So some of the procedures we use to get through the process that we talked about just a few minutes ago with a goal of getting a permit sort of as quickly as possible. Um, in phase one, you know, we talked about how this was the most critical um, phase of the process. The applicant really took control at this point and they found a local consultant that had the right knowledge. They involved their internal legal counsel and their senior management so that they could expedite internal decision-making processes with regard to the HCP. Um, they facilitated proactive communication with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as soon as they realized, you know, the situation that they were in to kind of talk about the process, explain where they were coming from and what they needed to accomplish. Um, we used good science and we did get creative, but within reason. Um, the plan area was nearly 500 acres and we were able to propose an innovative survey methodology that essentially could expedite the findings to determine the extent and type of take the plan needed to consider. Uh, we were in a position to develop really nice avoidance measures. Um, most of the sand skink occurrence was on the edge of the project, so we were able to avoid a significant amount of impact. Um, the remaining impact that was unavoidable, uh, you know, we developed a low risk mitigation strategy where we essentially were purchasing credits from a species conservation bank. Uh, some other concerns, you know, we were able to include other covered species. The blue tail mole skink is another federally protected species of skink, and we were able to get take authorization under the same plan. Uh, the gopher tortoise, which is a candidate species, and the eastern indigo snake, another federally protected species. We were able to build in minimization measures into the HCP to avoid the likelihood of take. And we were able to implement some other minimization measures for the sand skink as well. Uh, we ensured compliance with other laws. You know, the National Historic Preservation Act is, um, you know, pretty significant here in Florida. And sometimes if you're not going through a federal, federal permit process and you're not talking to state agencies about wetland impacts, you might not even get asked about that. And so when you start thinking about Section 10, you have to make sure you're evaluating what potential resources, cultural um, and historic resources might be within your permit area. 
Uh, we did consider the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I got caught up here. Um, you know, we considered those and in Florida, eagles are a big concern on many projects, but on this one, we really had no impacts to consider. Um, we provided funding assurances for the mitigation plan and the minimization measures. And ultimately, we developed a draft HCP for this project in 10 days. Um, I don't recommend that, uh, but it can be done um, when you're dealing with low effect HCPs and you put in the work up front to develop a solid plan. So next slide. Phase two um, is really our final outcome because there were no outstanding issues that surfaced throughout the permit process, um, you know, no fatal flaws, no public comments were received. We thought maybe we might get a few, but, um, and we were ready for that, but, but none came in. And so our permit documents were finalized and the decision timeline from start to finish was um, 12 months. So, you know, that's still quite a bit of time. And we obtained a five-year renewable ITP. Uh, for phase three, we were able to implement the conservation strategy pretty immediately. You know, I mentioned we purchased credits at a conservation bank and provided the receipt of that purchase back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. The applicant was able to proceed with their activities and really had that legal protection and um, regulatory certainty that they needed. We were able to implement avoidance and minimization measures as part of the action that benefited multiple species. And we were able to implement a pretty minimal monitoring program to ensure the take was not exceeded. Next slide. So I'm gonna end today by just talking about some of those BMPs um, that really are true for any HCP, but with a focus on you know, expediting the process for a permit. So the first key point is, you know, remember this is an applicant driven process. The applicant really needs to take control and use the tools available. Um, they really need to understand the regulations, know the species and the biology and build a solid team that's gonna get them through the process. Um, plan early and identify issues early. That just speaks for itself. You know, one of the pitfalls this project proponent dealt with in the beginning was that species occurrence was essentially overlooked. And, and that really put them in a bad position to try to have to really get through this process quickly. Um, you know, you want to avoid your impacts to the extent practicable. You want to develop a conservation strategy that meets the needs for the species. Um, use good science and get creative. As Trish said, don't get too creative, but when needed, it can be reasonable and it can be a good way to get through the process you know, no HCP is the same. Uh, consider the appropriate covered species for your plan. Um, I am told, and we haven't had to do this yet, but I am told that the HCP can constitute a special purpose permit under Migratory Bird Treaty Act and Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act authorization can also be issued under the HCP if you're meeting those permitting criteria as well. In addition, state agencies can use your plan to issue um, ITPs. And so, you know, when you're writing these plans, keep that in mind. That's another way you can streamline your process. Um, you know, always consider your compliance with other laws, NEPA and National Historic Preservation Act. Like I said, you know, you don't want to ignore the cultural and historical resources on your projects. Uh, provide quality information in your HCP. Submit a document that you know is ready to be reviewed and finalized. And what I think is the golden rule of life is communicate. You know, that's really going to get you through the process. Communicate with the agencies, communicate with your consultants, um, and just make sure that you, um, you have what it takes to get through the process. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jeremy. Great. Thank you, Colleen. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, and so I'm going to uh, welcome in Dr. Dale Sparks from Cincinnati here to take us to the next. So Dale, you wanna pick it up from here? Sure. Um, so before we get too far into talking about how uh, models can help streamline an HCP process, I've always feel like it's really important to start off with an understanding of what a model is. And the best definition I ever heard came from a uh, member of the faculty at the institution where I did my PhD. Um, Steve Lima would wander in every now and make a comment that a model is nothing more 
and the logical outcome of a series of assumptions. And what, what we mean by that is that, you know, when we put together a model, we try to go through and figure out how, we're usually trying to figure out how a bunch of things interact with each other. We capture that as best we can mathematically and then let it run. And it can help inform a lot of uh, decision-making processes uh, and, and including things here in the regulatory environment. As we move uh, into these, it's also really important to understand that models are tools, and that gets us to a second quote. Next slide. Probably the most often one used in my group is it, you know, that from uh, one of the most successful modelers and mathematicians of the 20th century noted that all models are wrong. Some just happen to be useful. And again, I think that gets to this idea that models are tools. That's all they are. They're not, uh, they, they are not an alternate reality. They're not a replacement for the real reality. So let's think a little bit about what we're gonna do with the uh, time that we have left available to us. So next slide. So we can, when we talk about how we use models and HCPs, I could break this out in you know, one to six uh, categories. Uh, I've chosen these four because they, they link together. The reason it could be one or six categories is it really, once you're to the point that you have to deal with uncertainty and you have to use a model, you really have, want to do, design and use a model that tracks you all the way through uh, the system. So today we'll talk a little bit about how we use models to estimate species distribution and abundance, which is you know, the original subject, as well as you know, how that uh, then steps down into the uh, uh, take that's occurring in the plan, what the impacts of that taking are, and then how you deal with the results of the impact of the taking, because that's what you're legally mandated to mitigate for. You're not mitigated or you're not legally mandated to mitigate for your take, but rather the impact uh, of that taking. And then uh, and the last thing we'll do is we'll wrap things up with a couple of, of considerations uh, and practical concerns before you try to use models in an HCP or if you're just reviewing HCPs or, or working with somebody on these things. Next slide, please. So I think the place that people most often uh, think about modeling for an HCP is when we deal with these models of distribution and abundance. The driving problem we have is most of the time on, on you know, for things like the sand skink situation that Colleen discussed, you, know, you can go out there, do a survey, find out where you do and don't, don't have the species. When we deal with the large programmatic plans, I'm, I'm working on one right now that is 10 species over 11 states. Uh, we've worked on multiple statewide forestry uh, HCPs, uh, including two that are illustrated here. In those cases, you know, we, we know, and, and these are uh, projects that were very heavily bat related, which is kind of my specialty. We, we know that the species out, is out there on the landscape somewhere, we're within the range. We just don't know how it's distributed at a more fine scale. So we can get at this a, a number of different ways. We can do it really simply like we did in Missouri on the uh, left side of your screen. Uh, in this case, we sat down the uh, experts from Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Missouri Department of Conservation and some of our biologists uh, and basically developed a map of areas of, of relative risk of encountering, uh, in this case, Indiana bats. Similarly, in the Pennsylvania bats and forestry HCP, what we did is we went through and used a mathematical tool, uh, maximum entropy modeling in this case, to, to take known occurrences, compare those to areas that we don't know if there are bats or not, and come up with an idea of those parts of the state that look most like the areas where the bat is known to occur. Uh, we were then able to run some statistical filters on it and they broke it down into two categories. Areas where we're in red, where we're worried about uh, the species occurring or high suitability habitat. And then areas of, uh, that are modeled in here on green with low suitability habitat. There are also a variety of other uh, statistical tools out here. I will tell you that when we were doing this plan, you know, every, you couldn't go anywhere without tripping over a paper using max of an en entropy. About the time the permit uh, went through, um, there was a backlash in the literature and people began to move back to things like maximum likelihood, uh, binary logistic regressions, binomial. There are a lot of statistical tools out there. Academics spend an enormous amount of time 
fighting over which of these is appropriate. The thing is most of these tools will work. All of them have strengths, all of them have weaknesses. Um, you, you need to talk to somebody, get an understanding of what's gonna work for you. Next slide, please. So something that goes immediately hand in hand with where you have the organism is where do you have areas of higher or lesser co uh, concentration? In Colleen's presentation, she said, you know, look, most of our sand skinks were along the edge. I would guess that many, many of that was in areas that, you know, you had surrounding native habitats and you had animals kind of lopping over the border. They did have some out in, in the middle of the project area. And so th that's, that, but they were at very low density. So we often are, are also, you know, if we don't even know where the thing occurs, how are we gonna have an idea of how many are out there? There are a number of ways that things are done. Of course, the regulations allow us to use habitat as a surrogate for the number of individuals that are uh, out there and the number of individuals that are taken, as long as there's a tight link between uh, the, the uh, uh, species occurrence and the type of habitat. At its simplest, we make basic assumptions, like if we assume that 10% of the habitat contains 10% of the population. If we do something like that in Pennsylvania, uh, the top map is statewide, the statewide model. At the bottom one, what we've done is we've excised the lands that are covered, that are owned and managed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. That's who the HCP was for. And you can see that most of that red is someplace else. This also gave us some really important information about most of the red is on either state parks or on uh, state game lands, as opposed to uh, state forest. Different management regimes, different purposes. Uh, it really meant that this, this solved about 90% of our problems with Indiana bats just having this map in hand because we knew most of the activities that the forestry department was doing um, are occurring in, in areas where the bat is very, very rare, probably absent. Um, again, we can go back to using the idea of habitat. Uh, so we, we can extrapolate from that SDM. Um, in this case, it's a quick and easy thing. Uh, we can also use things like occupancy models, uh, occupancy and encounter models. When we're really accounting for, you know, gee, you know, when we go out and survey for this thing in areas that look like it's suitable habitat, how often are we encountering it? We can account for things like trap shyness, trap attraction, all of those types uh, of variables and, and give us an idea of how much of that landscape is or is not occupied. And then we can also use, when we're trying to understand the number of individuals that are present or any, we can compare ourselves to known populations. I said, most of the stuff I do uh, relates to bats. For Indiana bats, we've got a long running uh, series of uh, population analyses that have gone on for the last 20 or 30 years. Those are readily available. Uh, it breaks it down by bats that hibernate in the state, bats that hibernate in the region, bats that hibernate in a recovery unit. And um, that gives us a tool to look at it. I mean, we know down to the number of individuals, we have an official, probably not, it, you know, it, it's, it's nowhere near as accurate as, as counting them down to the individual would tell you, but it, it, it is a very accurate assessment of what those populations are. And we're able to look, compare those uh, very easily and have some kind of regional clarity with minimal issues. Next slide, please. So when we get down to, to estimating take, uh, I always like to kind of start with the simplest uh, version. You know, the simplest formula to estimate take is that, you know, take is, in, is uh, basically the number of critters that are present multiplied by some kind of a risk factor. You can obviously expand this out into a whole series of binomials for different times of year, different activities, all of that stuff. Don't do that stuff if you have a situation like a wind farm, when we look at that, or avian mortality, where you know we've got tools out there that can just get straight to take because we're monitoring the number of individuals that we're picking up under the turbine and accounting for how often people are doing surveys, how many of these are removed by scavengers, all this. If you can get straight to take, go straight to it. Um, if you have to work from this habitat model, again, uh, you, you, you wanna set these up so that it just kind of flows through. Uh, if you're using habitat as a surrogate, again, back to this basic assumption, 10% root, 10% of the habitat, you take 10% of the population. Uh, you can continue to look, extrapolate from that species, uh, species distribution model, uh, assuming that you know, risk is related to the quality of the habitat. And that's, again, the tool we used in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, the slide on the, on the left is uh, spring fall habitat areas immediately around a hibernacula. Um, we can, if we're using occupancy and counter models, we can, we can throw out areas that we know are, uh, are unoccupied. Um, and, you know, like I've said, there are some activities that, you know, we already know what the risk is. We, we have a good idea of what the take is. There's no reason to fool around with another approach. Next slide. Once you've got an understanding of what you're, how many individuals you're taking, you have to go back and start this process of, of getting down to the impact of the taking. And, and it's really important that you do this because the impact of the take is what you have to mitigate for. Very often this is simply the grow back as many of them as you took, uh, but there may be some follow-ups. So the places that you would use models that you try to estimate things like the number of females, number of reproductive adults that are being removed, survivability of individuals that are being removed or potential reproductive success. Um, just to give you a couple of ideas, if you have a polygamous population and you remove a male, very minimal impacts most of the time. You remove a breeding female and you have a significant impact. Similarly, when we start looking at things like fish populations, uh, I've had a case where we've, you know, in a section seven document, indicated we're going to have just a through the roof take of a protected fish because we were doing work shortly after the spawn for other reasons. The recommendation was come back and do this at the end of the winter before they spawn because that's when you're going to take the smallest number of individuals. My response is I'm not a fishologist, but I do know that uh, there are an awful lot of those uh, those larval fish that don't make it to adulthood. However, if I come in right before the spawn, any fish I take is part of the breeding population. So this concept back to traditional game and habitat management of compensatory mortality is something that you need to think about when you look at the impact of the taking. Uh, a couple of tools that are out there are habitat resource equivalency analyses. Uh, next slide where we'll uh, talk about those things because they're also really valuable for uh, estimating the value of your conservation measures. The biggest challenge that you encounter on, on estimating your value of your conservation measures is, is what I think about as finding a, a fair exchange rate. So the uh, image on the uh, right is something from a theoretical paper that we put together, submitted, and it came out, out about the time we started the Pennsylvania Bats and Forestry HCP, and the, this and its companion image on uh, the impacts of timber harvest on Indiana bat foraging habitat um, really formed the basis of a habitat equivalency analysis that was used throughout that plan to demonstrate that uh, forest management, the way that Pennsylvania was doing it in the forest that Pennsylvania was managing is a self-mitigating uh, activity. Uh, habitat equivalency analyses are really useful if all you're doing is looking at the comparative value of different habitats. So back to Colleen's example, if you're taking out a bunch of area that is really low value for sand skinks, but what you're doing is buying credits in an area that is high quality for sand skinks or restoring areas of high value for sand skinks, you know, that's, you're, you're talking apples to apples, a habitat equivalency analysis is a valuable tool there. Conversely, if you start dealing with uh, having to do things like we do with bats, where you know you're cutting summer habitat, and you want to mitigate it by buying a cave, or you're um, dealing with you killed an individual, and how many acres of forest does it take to grow back an individual? Something like a resource equivalency analysis does it. My way of thinking about resource equivalency analyses is they basically are a mathematical tool for allowing you to change currencies, and and you know so think of a HIA as you know, I have investments out there and I'm trying to figure out what, what the impact on my portfolio was of, of you know, this one going up, this one going down, and this one going sideways, I can do that math relatively easily. What ARIA allows you to do is you have all of that stuff going on, but some of your investments are in dollars, some are in yen, some are in euros, some are in some other currency. And th this ARIA allows you to, to make those changes. Uh, you can also, of course, you know, uh, something I always talk about when we talk about um, the value of conservation measures is, you know, if you've used a species uh, distribution model, uh, you have a really, really important tool available to you. And 
when you end up with a population in an area that just doesn't look like it should have anything, it tells you one of two, maybe both things simultaneously. Either your model is wrong. That's okay. Models are always wrong. Sometimes they're useful. That's why we talk about it. However, it's if everything else by that by, about that model makes sense, works, you've run it past experts in the field, uh, it passes the sniff test, and you've sniffed it several times up close, it's very likely that that population in an area of low suitability that shouldn't be occupied is doomed unless there's some kind of an intervention. That is especially likely with these long-term uh, popular, these long live species, case selected species, like I deal with with bats. You know, we, we find things out there on the landscape all the time that I look at it and I'm like, boy, you know, we, here's a place we could plant trees and have a benefit tomorrow. It doesn't have to get big enough for them to roost in. It's a benefit in the here and now uh, because they could use landscape connectivity and uh, foraging opportunities. Uh, next slide. Uh, and a, and above all of these things, when you, 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 we get into these practical applications, um, there's always that advice about using the right tool for the right job. Well, in modeling, there's often a situation there's really not a right tool for everything you need to do. So what I recommend, my dad has an HVAC company, and he carries no power saws on his truck other than a uh, skills, than a uh, sawzall. His comment is as well, I could load the truck down with all the stuff that I need, could potentially need, or I could carry this one tool that it may not be perfect for very many jobs, but by God, if you can't do it with a saw, sawzall, it can't be cut. And uh, so I would encourage you to think about the sawzall principle from time to time. Part of this is be honest about your limitations. If, if you can't, if there's, if there's not a great way to do it, come at it from multiple, multiple approaches, average them, use one to set the high, use one to set the low. Um, if there's a standard out there, don't change it unless there's a good reason to do so. Um, you know, we see this with wind energy issues all the way with the uh, availability of evidence of absence software. If you've got all the mortality data from your facility, there is no reason for you to go out and create a new formula um, because I, I, I'm not a huge, I have some concerns with the way that EOA works, but the fact of the matter is at least we have something we can make relative comparisons across uh, different facilities. And at the end of the day, I always try to get people going back to the fact these are a tool. When I deliver to an, a, an applicant or the service or anybody else a model, you know, what I'm trying to give them is my best, most defensible, probably bad guess, uh, about what's going on out there because we're, we're always kind of hamstrung by the quality of the data uh, that we have available to us. And uh, there's just no getting past the, we, we don't know, this is our best way of coming to it. And you really want to make sure that the tools that you're using capture that uncertainty and capture the reality that you're uncertain because you don't want to be the victim of this next quote um, where we'll end. We're ready for that slide. Everybody's familiar with Benjamin Disraeli's notorious quote about lies, damned lies and statistics. I think the most important thing that people don't know about this is prior to being the prime minister, uh, Mr. Disraeli was actually a professional economist who used models. And when somebody brought one in to try to sneak past him a piece of legislation they wanted pushed through the parliament, this was his response because he knew what he was getting was statistics that were being twisted to tell a story as opposed to being used as a tool to make a decision. With that, I'll return it to Jeremy. All right, thank you, Dale, and thank you, Colleen, and thank you, Trish, thank you, everyone. I'm skipping through all this, just excited. We're talking about how much data is out there. This is what we're looking at right now with what we've been able to do with Ecobot over the last few summers together, almost 5,500 uh, wetland projects across the United States. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, the more we can build, the more we can build our models to uh, hopefully figure things out in a, in a better way, right? As, as Dale was leaning in there too. Uh, March 30th is our next webinar. We're going to be looking at workflow centric ways of dealing with some of our WOTUS woes. Um, yes, and I'm having fun with the W's there. Hopefully you will as well. Build tongue twisters. 
is what we're doing. So I know we're well past our time here today. Um, a lot of the questions that you all had posted inside of the Q&A channel have been curated and answered already. Um, Victoria did have to step out um, because she had something going on with her dog. So Trish, Dale, Colleen, thank you so much. Um, I will say no one got the quiz right. We definitely got it to genus. Sclerocactus is the correct genus. Uh, Samantha Cook and Eddie Zedeker um, got the genus correct, but no one got the species correct. It's Sclerocactus wetlandicus. Um, you went to basin in Utah. Um, so that's the Utah short spined uh, uh, cactus there. So um, I think uh, I think maybe Trish, Colleen, Dale, I think we should probably just go ahead and close it out just because we're so far after. And thank you for helping address some of the questions in the QA as we went. Um, I learned a lot from both of you. Hopefully everyone else in the audience did as well. We had over 170 people in attendance and 120 people stuck it out with us over time here. So thank you again for your time. If you would like to reach out to Dale, Colleen, Trish, uh, Victoria or myself, feel free to do so. We did record the webinar, so it's available for everyone. And uh, we'll hope to see you later in March and hopefully we'll do another t and &E based uh, webinar here in the near future. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy, appreciate it, thanks. You, you betcha. All right.